Well, welcome everybody. And uh, I also want to add my thanks to you for being uh, willing and able to adjust with the flow. The asthmatic amongst us are glad we don't have to preach out in the smoke, weaselly. Those of you who get to breathe just all day, every day with no issues, you might not get it, but those that get it, get it. So thank you for that. Also at 7 o'clock this morning, I thought it was going to rain. Now rain is the stuff in clouds that theoretically falls, I, I've been told. Um, someone should fact check that, really. Really, I'm, not, I'm just not totally sure. Hey, we've got a couple of uh, things before we get started here. Um, first of all, I want to welcome a few people. Uh, we are live streaming, you, you, uh, you might know that. And uh, is it me, Scott, or? It's, okay, we're good. Um, we're live streaming, and all the way from Portugal, we have a member of our family who you might not have met yet. His name is Chris Smith, and his wife and three kids, I think, they're joining with us. They're going to be coming to our church. Chris Smith um, is our... Uh, He has been employed by the denomination and he works at the district office. Uh, And uh, he is, I believe his title is, he is the assistant district superintendent. Chris Smith is a man who I admire and a a pastor who I admire, someone who I, uh, uh, boy, we're going to be richer to have Chris and his family here. His wife, Joanne, uh, she was also a pastor and she is now looking uh, to work in school and be a, a teaching assistant there. I think I'm right and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but it, that's real close to true anyway. And so uh, in Portugal, uh, welcome and that we're glad you're here. In the congregation today, we have got uh, some Ulrichsons that you might not have met before. They're right over here. Chris and Tara Ulrichson, uh, are, uh, they were missionaries in Mexico City, and they, are, they have returned home. Home is just outside of Edmonton, a place called Tofield. And we have got their kids here. Uh, and so you are very welcome here. We are glad that you are here. Uh, you need to know how seriously I take missions. Uh, it is the Christian and Missionary Alliance in order of importance. And uh, I take missions desperately seriously. I have prayed for you. I promise I have prayed for you. And I visited you in Mexico City. Do you remember that? And you were excited about me bringing Tim Hortons. <laughs> From here to there. And I, I hope you got to visit 100 Tim Hortons here. Uh, so you're just very welcome. It's funny you didn't bring your mom and dad, but uh, I'll hassle them later. I grew up with that family, and so... Um, We love you guys, and welcome here. Yeah. A point of celebration. Some of you may have already heard this, but uh, in this city there is an alliance church called Living Hope. Living Hope has been uh, searching for a new pastor, and they have found their new pastor. It's a guy named Tim Bussey. Tim Bussey is coming from uh, B.C., And uh, he's coming here. He's a guy who used to work for me years ago at a different church in a different life. Uh, And I've reminded him of that and said, I am buying him one coffee and he's buying me the rest of the coffees. (laughs) He said he would. We welcome Tim Bussey and we look forward to uh, God's blessing that the Bussey family will be at Living Hope. They're a great family. Him, his wife, and their four children. And... uh, That's a bit of a mind bend for me because I knew him as a freshman college student, uh, not dating anyone, no prospects, no plans, and now he's got kids and a wife. I don't know how that happened, but there we are. So uh, I'm not being mean. If you knew him, you anyway. He's saying the same thing about me right now. We have uh, some sad things that uh, we're going to offer up in prayer. Uh, Many of you will have heard of an airplane crash that happened, uh, six people in a small airplane flying to Salmon Arm. 
and they crashed in a very uh, difficult to get to area. All six people were killed. Those are people who are part of our extended alliance family. They come from Calgary, uh, primarily from a church called Rock Point, but also from a church uh, called Foothills. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Primarily from Foothills, but also some from Rock Point. And so there was a youth pastor with his wife and their brand new baby. And there were some others as well that uh, um, perished. These were believers. We know that. But there are people who are grieving, uh, left behind. And for those of you who grieve, you know that sometimes people say wise things and sometimes people say foolish things. They don't mean to, but it happens. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads with me and we are going to pray and offer these families uh, up to the Lord. And Lord God, you know all things. You know that uh, you know that families grieve, and extended families and friends and people grieve who are silent in the corners who you never would imagine are grieving. And Lord, as humans, boy, we are awkward. And we stumble and bumble and we try to say stuff and we, we sort of super sanctify stuff and, and say things that are meant to lift people up but what they actually do is crush people down. It's not because we are trying to, it's just because we don't always have the words to say. Holy Spirit, make those that surround these families wise with their words and their actions. Make those who do not seek wisdom silent. We pray for these families. We do not pray that they don't grieve. Rather, we pray that they grieve well and they grieve thoroughly. And they grieve wisely. Let them be surrounded by churches that will simply support them from practical feeding them to silent prayer that the families may never know who prayed it, but they know someone did. Lift this family up, or these families up. Oh God, oh God. Hmm. God, we just groan in front of you with no request beyond that. We just groan. You are good always and in all things, and sometimes we understand it. In your name I pray, amen. The one last thing I want to say before we get started is I just want to welcome Kim back. Where did you go? You were on vacation. It is, uh, listen, when a church hires an extrovert as a pastor, and then the following week, Almost the entire staff goes on vacation. It's a little awkward. Just saying. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to worship with you and your family. Did you bring your husband? Is he here too? Oh, there he's sitting right in front of you. That's good. I, um, God speaks to me in a lot of different ways. God speaks to me often. And I going to tell you a story of, of, it was a dream that God gave me that uh, I'm just dead sure is from God, and I think by the time I'm done, you might be as well. But I need to tell you, there is someone in this room, or there might be many people in this room, who have heard people say, God spoke to me, and what must be running through your head is, how? How do you know? How can you be sure? What does he sound like? I've never heard God. And so what I'm going to tell you is going to be the foundation that I am going to build this sermon on. But without this foundation, the sermon will go nowhere. So I want to tell you this. And... and if, if you can learn this and you forget everything else that is said today, we'll call it a success. If you want to hear from God, it will start with confession. You can go home now. 
if you hear nothing but that, if you want to hear from God, first it will start with you saying, God, you're real, you're God, I'm not God, and sometimes I have chosen me over you, and I need your forgiveness because you're God and I'm not God. If you can learn just that, we're good. But I'll go on. Every time I hear from God, it's because first I started with confession. And so I was asleep one night. <laughs> My wife wakes up a little more slowly than I do. And uh, sometimes I wake up with stories to tell her. And I have to sort of cushion that. I have to wait for, you know, a couple of beats before I can tell her what it is. But it's fresh with me and I want to tell her. And I had this dream. God speaks to me in dreams sometimes. And in this dream, I was on a dirt road. Not a gravel road, but a very smooth dirt road. Have you ever driven on a dirt road that's smoother than a paved road? Anyone ever done that? That's the road I was on. And there was a ditch over here, and there were some trees over here. And I was standing on the road. There was no traffic. And on this road was a pile of sand. Now, I want you to imagine sort of like a dump truck load full of sand. So it's taller than I am, it's broader than I am, it's a great big pile of sand. And I have a shovel, and God's there, and God says, Peter, I want you to shovel sand. Okay, God, I hear you, you your wish is my command, I will start to shovel sand. And so, shik, you know the sound of shovel into sand? And I start shoveling sand, and I start moving it from here to here. I'm worried. Am I, can I walk around here without the... Okay. I start moving sand from here to here. And I start shoveling. And sand is heavy. And sand is hot. And the temperature is hot. And I'm sweating. And the sand is sticking to me. And it's not terribly comfortable. And sometimes I plunge the shovel into the sand. And when it comes up, I see that in the sand is... You know when this stuff is not sand... It's still dirt, but it's not sand. It's dark, and it has stuff growing in it, which is a plant that nobody knows what that is, but there it is in sand. Do you know what I'm saying? And I'm shoveling. And I'm shoveling. And I'm shoveling hard. You, God told me that we got to move the sand. Do I need to change mics here? Okay, you're saying no. Does that mean this is going to stop? And so I'm shoveling sand. I, I start to get agitated because there's a lot of sand to move. And here's the problem. Every time I take a shovel full of sand, the pile of sand does not lessen in size any. You want to do a good job, don't you? You want, when, when a responsibility is given to you, you want to see it through. You want to get it done. You want to get it done in a timely fashion. You want to get it done in a thorough fashion. You want to get it done so that everyone can look at it and say, that was a good job done. That's what I want to do. And it's not happening because I'm shoveling sand and it's remaining. And I'm shoveling sand and there's more. And some of the sand that I shovel is ugly sand. And some of the sand that I shovel is pretty sand. But this pile's getting bigger. That pile is staying the same size. What do I do? And God comes back and he returns and he says, how's it going? And I bear my soul to God. And I say, God, the work is heavy. The willing people are few. There's much to be done. It's important stuff. It's God stuff. I don't know why I'm not surrounded by a hundred people that would help me move the sand. But God, I'm doing my best and it's not working. God, what's up? And God speaks to me in a tone that I have learned to listen for. It's a gentle tone. It's a loving tone. It's an invitational tone, and it is the only tone I have ever heard out of God's mouth. Even during correction, even during adjustment, 
It's a loving tone. And he says to me this, Peter, he knows my name. He says, Peter, if I wanted the sand over there, I'd have put the sand over there. What I asked from you was for you to shovel. I don't know if you've ever had a sleep that changed your life, but I have. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that changed your career. I have. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that would sustain you for the rest of your life because of the words God spoke to you in that dream, but I have. Within that dream, I found a freedom I did not understand before. We work hard, don't we? We work really hard. We work hard for promotion. We work hard for raise. We work hard because we were brought up that way. That's called pride. We work hard because if we don't, who's gonna? And we work hard, almost like God can't do it on his own. But don't worry, Peter's here. We'll get her done. If that dream resonates with you in any way, I want you to snap your fingers. As we were going through the book of Luke... As we're going through the parables in Luke, there's a bunch of uh, there's a bunch of people who are listening to these parables. Some of them are happy with the parables. Some of them don't like the parables. They they are uh, troublesome to them. That's not how good Jewish people operate. That's not how the Torah or the Old Testament has taught. That's not that's. That's just not what we are expecting from the coming Messiah that we have heard about for our whole lives, that our ancestors have heard about all the way back from even Moses' day when they left slavery, where God provided manna, where God provided this pillar of light, and we've been hearing and expecting this Messiah coming from the line of David, and now there's this Jesus guy who who some of us think he's the Messiah, and some of us think he's definitely not the Messiah, and he keeps teaching stuff that's troublesome, and sometimes he comes up and he answers a direct question with a story. Don't you hate that? hey, what do you want for supper? And the other person says, well, you know, when I was a kid, my favorite supper was, you will notice I am not looking at my wife over here because that's how I talk. Drives her nuts. Probably should. Jesus' ministry doesn't look like the people expect. They're coming to him with direct questions. They want direct answers. I ask you a question. I want a yes or no. Instead, Jesus teaches, and his imagination is wildly beyond what the question is. So in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8, there is a parable that Jesus teaches. I love how the NLT writes this one, and so I'm going to read it to you in the NLT. If you've brought another version, you can follow along. It's pretty close, but I'm going to point out a few things that the NLT says that I just think are really clearly worded. And so I'm going to start in verse 1, give you a minute to get there. Uh, Whoever's got the NIV here, call out the page number. This NIV. 722. Okay. If you've got this one, turn to 722. One day, Jesus told the disciples a story to show them that they should always pray and never give up. (sighs) I really don't like how this starts. Always pray and never give up. Like never give up? Never give up praying? Jesus says this, There was a judge in a certain city. He came to neither fear God nor care for people. So he doesn't care what God says. 
It's not even a question of does God exist. It's a question of that doesn't make any difference to me at all. I'm not, it's, God, you, you believe in God, I don't believe in God, whatever, away we go, who really cares? But also, he doesn't care what people think, which means the only conclusion is he is there entirely for his own benefit and no one else's. Jesus knows this, and he's teaching this. A widow came to him repeatedly saying, Give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Now we're going to have to dig into this a little bit because often when I think about a widow, I think about maybe a senior citizen. Maybe someone who's lived a long life and now towards the end of their life, this senior citizen is coming with a complaint. But when Jesus is teaching this, the average lifespan of a person is far shorter and women live in a very complicated reality. They can't own anything. They can't make money. They are dependent on their husband and their husband's family for their everything, including food. And so we have a widow. I want you to, this time, I want you to picture a woman. Let's put her at about 30. She has no husband. She does have a very long life ahead of her, probably. Unlikely she'll be sent to war. Unlikely she'll be killed that way. And somebody owes her something. And whatever it is that they owe her, she will eat off that. But there's a judge who doesn't care for God doesn't care for people, certainly doesn't care for justice, but does care very much for himself. And even in his response, his response to her is, if I bring her justice, she'll go away. That's beneficial for the judge. This woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant complaints. Then the Lord said, take a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. Even though his intentions were unjust, his intentions were selfish. But the decision was just. So don't you think that God will surely give justice to the chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. Scott, I'm going to switch over to this mic. It's okay, God knew that mic wouldn't work either. Like a guitar chord. There's a point in here. Don't lose this point. Don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. That word quickly is troublesome, isn't it? Because oftentimes when I pray to God, I want him to act right now. Is that just me? I think about the Israelites, the story of Moses. Do you remember the story? Moses was, well, he was born and then he sort of became part of a royal kind of world in a very weird kind of a way. And he existed there and life was pretty good for him until he saw something that he hated and he ended up killing a guy and that meant he had to run. And so he ran and he became a shepherd. 
And a shepherd, that's, that's pretty low on the totem pole. You, you sleep with the, in the fields with the sheep. It's gross. It smells bad. It's sticky. There's mosquitoes. There's bugs. And then something is called from him, and he ends up, what does he end up doing? You remember this. Come on. What does he end up doing? You're allowed to talk in church. It's okay. I'll wait right here. What does he end up doing? He goes to Egypt. And he ends up leading the Israelites, the slaves. Do you remember what God said to him? He said, I have heard the cry of my children. But when Peter prays, I want God to act right now. And if God doesn't act right now, and if he doesn't act in the way that I expect him to act, in the way that I ask him to act, in the way that I demand he act, then my response is, God doesn't act. Perhaps God doesn't care, or maybe God doesn't exist. And I can really quickly quit praying. Really quickly. Don't you think that God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. One of the things that we need to understand is that God's timeline is different than ours. Sometimes God works outside of time. Here, let me, I'm just going to give you this one. This is going to bend your brains. God is preparing a place for us. Yes? When Jesus was dying on the cross, he says to the person beside him dying on the cross, today you will be with me in, he in heaven. Right? But God is coming to reclaim earth, to make it heaven. Right? That can't be. I just blew up every accountant's mind in the place. The math doesn't work. The columns don't balance. Unless he's God. Unless his imagination is wildly beyond ours. Have you ever wondered if God has answered your prayer, prayer retroactively? Have you ever wondered? I pray this. Maybe it's something you would pray, except that God has already acted. He's God. Bring it to him. Ask him. I do wonder that. He's God. Remember the stories in the Bible where someone was dead and then Jesus said, no, they're not? Hmm. Time. God. But it is not hard for me to say, God, you need to bend to my understanding of time. Or you don't exist. Jesus makes persistence an example, something, something to be looked for, something to be sought out, something to be chased. And then there is this verse. But when the Son of Man returns, this is the coming Messiah, this is Jesus who we wait for. When the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on earth who have faith? Not justice. Not success in moving the sand from here to there. Not a list of people who you have guided to become Christians. Not a tidy bit of work that you saw through to the end. That's not what he's looking for. What he is looking for very clearly is those who have faith. Well, what does faith look like? Faith looks like persistence. What does persistence look like? Persistence looks like asking God what he would have you do and you doing it and you trusting that God will be able to come up with the result that he's looking for. Suddenly, this pastor is able to come to church and is able to say, today we will have a service. Perhaps it will be outside. Perhaps it will be inside, but we will have a service. Because what was asked of me is to have a service, not a location. 
It means there's things I don't complain about. Perhaps there's some music that is not my favorite kind of music. God did not ask me to make a church that has my favorite kind of music. He did not ask you to attend a church that has your favorite kind of music. If this church has your favorite kind of music, wonderful. But if not, what he is looking for is persistence. Will you come? Will you serve? Will you be part of what God is already doing? I've said this before. There's a prayer repeated in my family's house all through my growing up, and it's said in my house, and we just offer this up to God regularly. God, catch me up in what you are already doing. Let me jump onto that train car that's already moving. Lord, let me be part. I want to smell your aftershave. I want to see your fingerprints. Wherever you are, I want to be there. And God says, who has faith? Not who has been the most successful. When I was in uh, every single grade of my life, we would go into gym and there was that kid that won everything, ran faster, climbed harder, until it became wrestling. Then it was Peter's turn to shine. (laughs) Picking one kid up here, picking the other kid up there, bam, they go down. That was my sport. Speech class. Look out. Give me a topic. I don't need to prep. You want to hear about dogs? I will tell you about dogs. I will convince you even though I'm wrong. That's how God has gifted me. Run really fast. Nope, that one's not mine. Do you remember when you used to go on field trips? And who was always the slow kid? It was the fat kid. Always the slow kid. And everyone else gets up to the place that they're supposed to go. And they, they're waiting for the fat kid to get there. And the fat kid finally gets up there, sweat dripping from their face. And everyone else says, they're here. Okay, let's go. I'm allowed to say that. I'm, I'm the fat kid. Stephen, you should be quiet. I'm just saying, man. You were up there drinking your water bottle. and I... But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Not a checklist. Faith. Who have said, I will do what is asked, because Jesus was the ultimate servant, and I will be like him. Who, if they say, we need help in the nursery, and you say, I don't do nursery, huh, today you do. Who will say, we need someone to get up to read scripture. I don't like standing in front of people, but I will serve. I, I, watch, I watch the kids ministry thing here. You need to know I would preach a hundred sermons before I did that. I've proven it. That's intimidating to me. To get a whole bunch of kids to pay attention as I go through. And I don't know how to buy fruity pebbles. I wouldn't think about buying. And if I bought them, I'd eat them. And I get here and everyone gets the Cheerios. Nobody wants the Cheerios. I want you to leave those right there. I need a jug of milk stat. But to be willing. God looks for those who are faithful. I want you to be very careful about something. Do not be faithful in what is measurable and unfaithful in what is holy. It's backwards. You have a problem. Do you ever think if you were one of the disciples, following Jesus around, learning what Jesus said, and then at the end of Jesus' life, he goes to heaven after he is resurrected from the dead, and the disciples are there. Now what? Okay, well, we better get to business. We better start. We better start. We got to, listen, we need a spreadsheet. We're going to need a PowerPoint up here. Someone needs to get me some highlighters and some dry erase markers. Like, this is business time. But what God said to them is, it is done. Be faithful. Be faithful. Persistent prayer equals persistent faith. 
The enemy of that is the sneaky little thing that gets into your head that says, if God won't, then I have to. If I don't do it, then it won't get done. Are you sure? This inevitably leads us to believe a few things. When we pray and we don't see God respond how he, we want him to respond and when we want him to respond, this can look like God isn't for you. Romans 3 verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? God is for us. Sometimes our prayers aren't broad enough. Sometimes our eyes are too singularly focused. We are looking for a specific outcome, but what God gives us is something so much greater. And I would love to tell you stories about that. I have many, but I would encourage you, ask the person next to you, has God ever answered a prayer in a way you couldn't have imagined? We could also get to the place where we think that God is not listening. In the book of Proverbs chapter 15, we find this, verse 29. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. He hears those who come to him first and saying, God, you are God. And I am not God. And there is a division between us. We'll call it sin. And I will confess my sin to you, God. And I will say, God, I have chosen myself when I could have chosen you. There are these addictions in my life. I don't think I can get away from them, but I know that they are sin. My temptation is to throw in the towel and say, it is how it is, how it always will be. He hears the prayer of the righteous. He is for us. Or we could be tempted to think that God is not paying attention. Now, fair enough. There's bigger stuff going on in this world. The war in Ukraine. The stuff happening in the Middle East. The political situations in different parts of the world. Famine. Abuse. What we hear stemming out of the residential school situation. The the world of sexual abuse that works within pornography and, po- and uh, um, paying for sex. All that stuff. Surely he won't hear me. Surely my cry out to him saying, God, help, I'm alone, I'm scared. I will need to hear your voice. Surely he won't hear us. Jeremiah 29, verse 12. In those days when you pray, I will listen. He knew my name. It was a dream about shoveling sand. So, earlier, several weeks ago, I moved from Kindersley to Regina. You might have heard something about that. And we pulled into our new area on Morris Crescent probably about 15 houses, both sides of the street. And I pulled up first. And God spoke to me. And he said, I want you to pray for your neighbors. I wish I was more spiritually mature than I am. I immediately flashed to God, you want me to convert all of my neighbors. And I have to do that here. We have to start now, and in a gentle, warm, inviting, correctional, loving, soft way, he reminded me, I I got this. What I asked from you is for you to pray for your neighbors. And I had a little moment, me and my F-150, sitting there. Okay, God. You want me to pray. And so I've begun to pray. 
I don't know what will happen from this. I know what I hope will happen from this, but I promise you I'm looking for the fingerprints of God. I'm looking to smell his aftershave so that I can catch up to what he was doing long before I ever got there. Long before we ever found the house. Long before we were ever thinking of it. Perhaps long before I was born. And I'm watching. This church is in a time of refresh, both in the building and also in the personnel. I have to say that before you call me stale. My name right now is Refresh. If we wander over into the sanctuary, oh, I know we might be tempted to talk about the color. We might be tempted to talk about the timing. We might be tempted to talk about this thing used to be there and now it's somewhere different. How'd that happen? <laughs> There's an old joke. How many Alliance pastors does it take to change a light bulb? I said, how many Alliance pastors does it take to change a light bulb? <laughs> change! My grandpa gave us that light bulb. <laughs> I am the only person here allowed to tell that joke, by the way. We might be tempted to complain. Oh my. Oh my, what was asked of us? What was asked of us? What if we lay down the right to ever mention color again? What if we lay down the right to ever mention where the soundboard is or what brand of soundboard that might be? What if we lay down the right to say, I'm too busy? Did you ask? Did you say to God, am I too busy? Did you say to God, do you want me to do this? What if we laid down those rights and looked to God and said, God, Pastor Peter had a dream about shoveling sand. Is that my dream? Is that for me? Ask and listen.